speaker, Dr. Uh, Rajiv. Dr. Rajiv, could you please uh, share? Yes, I will start yes, sharing. I will. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. My presentation, see. Now, sorry for that one. Open. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is Dr. Salam. Can you see and confirm that you can see my slides and you can hear yes, me? Uh, yes, yes, okay. perfect, very well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for this. I will uh, just say uh, I will introduce you. <laughs> okay. 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 Good. Okay. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> Uh, I can't. I cannot uh, find way how to start with very massive CV of Dr. Uh, Rajiv Virchini. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, for accepting my invitation to deliver your uh, remarkable and outstanding research through IPGG. Uh, Dr. Rajiv is an agricultural research scientist spe specializing in genomics and molecular breeding with over then. Uh, 20 years of service in developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. He is currently serving as a research program director, accelerated crop improvement, and director, center of excellence in genomics and system biology at the International Crops Research Institute for the semi-arid uh, tropics. Uh, tropics. He is a globally recognized leader for his work in genomic, in genome sequencing, genomics assisted breeding, and transitional genomics in legumes and cereal crops and capacity building in the developing countries. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rajiv has made a centrally important contribution to improving for uh, improving food security in India and Africa by creating genomic resources of nine major orphan tropical uh, crops. He has developed a DNA marker technology uh, for the identification of useful genetic variation in these key crops. Uh, he has a massive highly profile author and a highly cited researcher for seven consecutive years. Um, he has over than 500 publications uh, with each index of 105 and citation uh, 404. Uh, 44,809. He has um, an elected fellow to up uh, to about 10 science and agriculture academics society, India, Germany, USA, and Australia. Uh, thank you again for uh, showing up and um, giving us um, a remarkable about remarks uh, on your uh, research. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you once again for very nice introduction and would like to thank Dr. Salam once again for your inter, uh, for invitation. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, because we have this virtual meeting. So many places you will have the different time zones. I'm very happy to see many known faces, many friends in this meeting. Like, yeah, so I was very happy to see Andreas Borner and many other friends in this meeting. So thank you very much once again. So now, as Dr. Salam mentioned, I will talk about some of our efforts in genomics and breeding innovations for legume improvement. And you can ask this question why we need it, because there are many international challenges which are affecting international agriculture. So they are the global challenges. And one of the key challenges, and this is population growth. You can see that it took about 2010 years for the whole world to reach or more than that 7 billion population. On the other hand, in just next 40 years in the world will add another 2.8 billion population. So basically we will be having more than 9.5 billion. Some people say 10 billion population by 2050. Some countries like India they will be adding many more population. Right now they are already 1.3, but will be reaching 1.66. They will become the largest populous country on the planet, which is not good. But at the same time, 
if you see that during last 30, 40 years, the world has made really good progress. However, there are still several areas in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia that they are affected or they are having the issue of the nutrition and food security. One in nine people in the world still faces hunger and one in five people in Africa and malnutrition is also another serious problem. So basically we are talking about feeding 9.7 billion population. This means we need to add or we need to have more than 70% additional food. In some countries, we still have the question of that protein. Countries like India, where more than 80% of the Indians suffer protein deficiency because of their food habits or non-affordability to have the protein ESS rich food. In all these regards, several and you can have this protein from the different kind of sources. You can have from the animal protein, you can have the plant-based protein. But then there are several issues if you would like to consider the climate change related issue, water footprints, carbon footprints. So in these regards, some crops like legume crops, they are the important source of the proteins. Among them, a few crops like chickpea, pigeon pea or groundnut or peanut. This is also called peanut in many countries. These are the important crops. They are grown by smallholder farmers in developing countries in Asia and Africa, and they are the important source not only for the proteins, but also for income generation for the smallholder farmers. And however, the crop productivity for these crops is less than one ton per hectare traditionally, but in recent years, many efforts have gone in this direction and we are working in the direction to improve the crop productivity. So friends, there is a big challenge before the agriculture science community and the, the challenge is we need to provide more food with the less resources. Less resources means less arable land, less water, less labor. And we need to consider carbon footprint, water footprint, etc. And across the whole world, people are very really worried about these things. So to address these issues, Crop Improvement Community, which includes breeding and other disciplines, including genomics, biotech, crop physiology, pathology, entomology, seed system, or all kind of disciplines, basically. So we work together. And in this direction, what we do, we're doing that they are always developing the better varieties with enhanced crop productivity, addressing the issue of the diseases, pest resistance, environmental stresses, enhancing the nutrition and taking care of sustainability. So these are the key areas. But now we need to have some advanced approaches. Way back in 2005 when I used to work in IPK Gutters 11, at that time point together with Professor Andreas Graner and Professor Mark Sorrells, we gave a concept in 2005 called Genomics Assisted Breeding for Crop Improvement. We provided the concept that how genomics approaches can be used in the crop improvement in the 10th anniversary issue of the trends in plant sciences. And then after about 15 years, trends in plant science, they have invited us in the 25th anniversary special issue to discuss that what kind of progress we have made in that genomics assisted breeding. And not only that we documented the progress, we also provided further concept that how in the current scenario, how we can move ahead, what kind of new approaches need to be integrated for the crop improvement and we call it genomics assisted breeding 2.0 or GAV 2.0. I will discuss some of these areas that how we can go from the gene bank to have the next generation of the breeding. Nowadays we are talking these approaches as a fast forward breeding also and I will discuss about that one, not how we can move in this direction. So in this from the concept of the fast forward breeding which we provided in the trends in genetic this year and we believe that when we start from the plant genetic resources or the breeding population for any given crop first thing is that we need to have the high quality reference genome in many crops we already got them and then once we have the germplasm from the gene bank or the breeding population 
we need to have the sequencing and genotyping when you are talking about the developing countries. We need to think about the democratization of the sequencing technology. We need to focus, have more emphasis on the phenotyping as well. And now based on the sequencing genotyping, you can go in the area of pen genomics. You can combine these things. You can go for the trade mapping. And after that, one can identify those alleles or haplotypes and then can use in the breeding program. In this direction, many of you may be heard about the pen genome. So pen genome is that, for instance, if you see these red color individual, they are the four individual. And if you sequence all these four different genome, you will find some genes are present in this one, not in this one, but some additional genes are present here. So by analyzing the genomes of all these four different individuals, one can develop a pen genome. And this pen genome is basically the gene repertoire of all these four different individuals. And then this is called that pen genome of this particular species. Now with the objective to utilize the crop wild relatives in the crop improvement, we also give a concept of the super pen genome and super pen genome is that for instance in the case of chickpea, we can have this pen genome of size or eritinum. <coughs> Sorry. Similarly, we can have another pen genome for another species like size reticulatum, another species size or echinospermum or size judaicum. And then you get the pen genome for each of these species. Then you can combine all these pen genomes together and you can develop a pen genome at the genus level like size level. And then you call that genome or pen genome as a super pen genome. And nowadays they are also becoming very popular super pen genomes in many crops. People are moving ahead in this direction. At Ecrisat, way back in 2007, after coming from Germany in 2005, we established the Center of Excellence in Genomics and Systems Biology. We have the state of the art genomics and sequencing facilities, not very high end facilities as you can have in many other genome sequencing centers, but nevertheless, we got the moderate facilities. So by using these facilities and the partnerships around the world in Africa, in Asia, in Australia, North America and Europe, we have been developing the reference genomes for the different Ecrisad mandate crops. Ecrisad works on chickpea, pigeon pea, groundnut, palmyrin and sorghum. In these crops, we did not have much genomic resources. These crops used to be called orphan crops, but during last 10 years or so, we have developed the reference genome assembly for pigeon pea, chickpea, palm millet, and also for the peanut for both genomes, A and B genomes, and then also the different subspecies of peanut. And not only that, we also have been working with our other partners where we have developed the genome assemblies for sesame, moong bean, ajuki bean, pea, and soya bean. So we have been working on all these different aspects. I feel very happy and proud to say that our genomic center has delivered genome assemblies for more than 10 different crops species. And then when you develop the gene genome assemblies, people can do the gene annotation, gene prediction, but then you do not understand the gene function in the real cell or so. So for that, what we have done to understand the dynamics of the gene expression, we have developed the gene expression atlas for chickpea, pigeon pea and groundnut. What you do here that you sequence or you do the transcriptome sequencing for more than 30 to 40 different tissues representing different plant life cycle parts. And then you understand that temporal and spatial gene expression for each of these species. And we are working now. We are using the gene expression atlas to understand the genes in different abiotic and biotic stresses pathway, etc. Other thing is, as I told about this pen genome thing that if you have one individual genome, this does not solve the problem. So what we did in the last few years, we have sequenced around 300 pigeon pea lines. And these after sequencing of the 300 pigeon pea lines, we understood the center of origin of chickpea, migration route, evolution. And also we did the phenotyping and we identified the genes associated with the traits which are important related for the climate change. The same thing in the case of chickpea. We sequenced more than 430 lines and we also identified genes or markers associated with yield under drought and heat stresses. And then recently we completed a big project where we have done the whole genome sequencing at 10x to 30x coverage for more than 3000 chickpea lines. This paper will be available on 10th November in Nature. 
And in this paper, we have talked about the development of the pen genome based on the 3000 species. We understood the species divergence of the different sizer species. We understand we understood the center of origin and also the migration route of this chickpea. And we did the phenotyping of all these 3000 chickpeas at six different locations for two different years and also analyzed a lot of nutritional traits and we have done the GWAS analysis, etc. Identified the haplotypes. I will talk about it later. So I think what I want to say, it is possible now not sequence one genome or two genome, rather thousands of the genomes, and this is being possible in many crops as well. Once you are having these genomic resources, then you need to develop the genotyping platform so that you can screen the breeding population in the cost effective manner. And in this aspect, in each of our legume species, we develop the genotyping platform, including SSR, DART, genotyping by sequencing, whole genome resequencing, 56,000 SNP arrays, even 2,000 SNP arrays, 10 SNP panel when you are doing the foreground selection in the marker assisted back crossing. So we have developed all different kind of genotyping platform. And as I said earlier that we have in many cases through the breeding program by parental mapping population, some multi parental population from the gene bank, we are having the diverse genotypes. And then we can have the sequencing or genotyping of all these population. We can have the phenotyping and we use the next generation mapping approaches. And by combining all these things during last 10 years or so, we have been able, we have been successful to map 20 to 50 traits in each of these crops like in chickpea, drought tolerance, heat tolerance, salinity, escochyta, helicorpa, the same thing in the case of groundnut, in the case of pigeon peas. So we have been able to map large number of traits across these different crops. So this is about the identification of markers or genes or those things. Secondly, sometimes you may be interested to identify the genes and for that we are using the systems biology approach. And what is the system, systems biology approach is that many times people just do the transcriptome or such, sometimes they just do the proteome or some metabolome. We believe that we need to combine all these different data sets, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, epigenome together with genetic variation in the germplasm. And then we need to combine these things with that uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence approaches so that we can understand or we can predict that function of those different genes, we can identify the different genes and metabolic pathways. When you would like to do the systems biology approaches, you need to understand, you need to have your hypothesis, you need to design your experiments and you need to generate the data from this by using the omics technology, you need to integrate and then in the end you can link genotype to phenotype. And we have been using this kind of approach in the different uh, uh, crops for the different uh, stresses. So for instance, here in the case of chickpea for the drought tolerance, we have integrate, we have done integrated analysis of transcriptome, proteome and metabolome for drought tolerance. By using these things, we have identified some pathways and also some metabolites which are responsible for providing that drought tolerance. Also. This is big work, but I'm just trying to summarize the same thing. In the case of pigeon pea, where we have the cytoplasmic male sterility based hybrid breeding system, and here we are trying to understand a very important phenomena for fertility sterility reversion. And we have started here from the pollen grains and those kind of anther cell, and we have done transcriptome, metabolome, and proteomics works there. And then we have identified some genes involved in the auxin biosynthesis pathways, which are responsible for fertility or sterility reversion in the case of pigeon So you can use these kind of approaches in any crop for any stress or so. So now either you identify the genes or markers associated with the trait. And as I said, at Ikri said, we are very much interested to use these information. Either you call it genomics assisted breeding, you call it translational genomics. So we would like to use these approaches for developing the varieties with the uh, higher productivity and we are very happy to mention that together with several partners around the world like Ethiopian Institute of Agriculture Research, we were successful to develop and release that variety for drought tolerance in Ethiopia in 2019 
we have been successful to develop another drought tolerant variety in India in 2019 together with Indian Agriculture Research Institute and for diseases for the fusarium wilt resistance we did it from University of Agriculture Sciences Dharwad and in the 2020 again we have developed some of these lines for that fusarium wilt resistance in the case of India. Recently, we also completed a big project where we wanted to introgress a genetic region called QTR hotspot for drought tolerance in three different elite varieties. And we after we recently this year itself, we were successful or that in India in 2021, they were successful to release two drought tolerant line IPLCZ 414 4005 and they are coming by introgressing those QTL hotspot and similarly another fusarium wilt resistance. So in summary, in the case of chickpea, we have delivered more than seven different varieties by introgressing this different genomic region through molecular breeding. And we are also very excited to mention that Prime Minister Modi, when he was dedicating 35 varieties on that World Food Program Day World Food, uh, in, in 2021, out of those 35 varieties, two varieties of chickpea, they were coming from this set. So this also gives us a lot of satisfaction. Not only in chickpea, in the case of groundnut or peanut, where we are talking about the oil and oil is really, if you see that linoleic acid is not good for health, but in sometimes some varieties in US, they are having more oleic acid, very minimal amount of linoleic acid. By doing these molecular breeding or genomics assisted breeding approaches, we developed Grenar 4 and Grenar 5 and these two varieties were included the package which was dedicated by Prime Minister Modi in 2020 and they were also here. So we feel very happy that these varieties which we are developing, they are getting the recognition at the highest level in the government and the political system as well. Now this is another set of the varieties for the foliar disease resistance released in the Dharwad and at that time point, this is the agriculture minister in Indian state of Karnataka and some of these lines. Now this have been released by one of our collaborators, Dr. Rameswar in the case of uh, groundnut or peanut. Similarly, some other university, University of Agriculture Sciences, uh, Raichur, they also have released some of the pigeon pea varieties. They are coming again for the fusarium wilt resistance, etc. So in this way, we have developed and released more than 11 varieties. Now you can ask that, well, what is next now? And next is that I think this is fine that we need to have these molecular breeding approaches, but we need to go next level. We need to make our breeding program fast forward. How you can do it? I think we have provided a concept of the framework of the fast forward breeding. And this means that once you are having from the genome sequencing and analysis, these haplotypes, etc., then you can use approaches like haplotype based breeding. What does it mean? And I will tell later that once you are having the genes, you can do the gene and phenotype analysis, you can identify superior haplotypes. We need to go for the genomic prediction approaches. A new approach of optimal contribution selection, especially when you bring from the gene bank and sometimes when you are having these wild material or so, and if you take too much material, then you will be bringing a lot of linkage drags, but then you will be having higher diversity. But if you go to the higher diversity, then you will not have that much introgression of the wild material. So you need to have some balance and we need to have the optimal contribution of these parents. So we need to work on these directions. And the genome editing is another approach. And I'm very happy to see that Dr. Salam has assembled eminent scientists from the different areas and they will talk different points here. I'm not going to discuss about genome editing, but some of this work in this direction. So as I said about the haplotypes, what are the haplotypes? You can read this thing more in the recent paper in the advanced genetics. And what happens that when you are having this whole genome sequencing data, now this is the genotype one and you are having these different genes and for each of these genes, if you can identify the haplotype now, for instance, for gene one, you got four haplotypes across the different regions. For gene two, you got these four haplotypes and here you got like this thing, but then you do the analysis with the phenotyping data of each of the individual and by combining these things, you identify, oh, for gene 1, S3 haplotype is good. For gene 2, H1 haplotype is good. So like those kind of thing. And then you ask a question that elite varieties which you are growing in the farmer's field nowadays, what kind of haplotypes you are having and how you can introgress the superior haplotype and this approach called haplotype based breeding. And we are moving ahead in this direction. In the case of pigeon pea, for instance, for drought tolerance, we have identified some exciting haplotypes. We are moving ahead. And in the case of chickpea also, I will talk in a minute, but other approaches, genomic selection or genomic prediction. 
Here you don't select the line just based on one or two locus or loci, but we select the lines based on the whole genome profiling. And this is based on these things. We can calculate, estimate the breeding values on these called genomic estimated breeding values, and we can do the genomic prediction. In each of our crop in chickpea, groundnut and pigeon pea, we have been working on that doing the genomic prediction and our experiments indicate that you can enhance high level of efficiency, not only for that line development, but also for the hybrid breeding. So I think that all these data is already published. You can find the papers. You can read more about these things. But what I want to say that by using these approaches, you can really enhance your efficiency further. Based on this 3000 chickpea genome sequencing data, as I told earlier, and we had a lot of phenotyping data, genotyping data by analyzing 19 million haplophenotype combinations. We have identified about 24 superior haplotypes for these different uh, traits. And now we are moving ahead that how to integrate these haplotypes in the better lives. Same thing for the genomic prediction, and we have been using this three, four different approaches, optimal contribution selection, Bayesian generalized linear regression, HOGEM prediction machine, haplotype based local GBV. So based on the genome sequencing projects, you can redefine your breeding objectives, your breeding methodology. That's the way that we are moving. Now, by using these kind of genomics approaches, what you can do, you can maximize the genetic diversity. You can develop the better varieties. But now, if these vector varieties do not reach to the farmer's field in the real time, then also they cannot harvest higher produce. And I have seen many times when I visit the many developing countries here in Asia and Africa, farmers, they are still growing in several countries, even 20 to 30 year old varieties. So the question is how we can work in this direction. And we believe that even if you use the genomics, but if they are not reaching to those farmers field, then this is not really good. So in this concept, what we are trying to do that we say that not only that you need fast forward breeding methods, we believe you need to have the rapid delivery systems also. What is this rapid delivery system? And these are all very much relevant in developing countries. So now when you develop these elite varieties, either through the traditional breeding or molecular breeding, they need to reach to the farmers in the faster manner. For that, you need to strengthen your seed system. In many developing countries, seed system is broken, so we need to fix them. Now, once farmers is having these high elite, vari these elite varieties, they need to provide the digital decision support tools either through their telephones or so, so that they should have the information when the crop should be grown, when we should do the sowing, fertilizer, irrigation. So you need to provide all these agronomy packages to the farmers. And when they grow these crops, we need to ensure that you should have minimal reduction in the or we should have minimal post harvest losses and then only you can have the higher produce and then you need to plan or you need to work somewhere that how these farmers, they are connected to the markets with minimal number of intermediaries. And after that, it would be a good idea if you can have the value addition so that they can reach to the farmer. So I think this whole system, the delivery system needs to be made the rapid. So we need to talk not only fast forward breeding, but also the rapid delivery system. We have done some of these work in some of these big projects. Like I have a pleasure to lead one big project called Tropical Legume Project, which had the three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, funded by Gates Foundation. And we had the collaborator from the CIAT, IITA and 15 different national programs here in Africa and also in India and Bangladesh. And this was a big project it started from 2007 to 2020 or so. And I had the pleasure to lead this project for about seven, eight years as a PI, principal investigator. And what we did that through this collaboration and these are the big partnership. Through this partnership, we were successful to deliver around 266 improved varieties to produce about 500,000 certified seeds, 6.1 million ton grain was produced. And all these information have been documented in a special issue of the plant breeding in volume 138 issue 4. And also in the two books that how you can have these legume seeds and more cash uh, reaping. Same thing that for instance, the other one is that how you can develop those smallholder farmers access to the improved platform. So I think this is really very good thing. And based on these projects, you can see in several cases that how these were very successful to enhance the crop productivity. So for instance, if you see 
in the case of uh, Ethiopia, in the case of chickpea or cowpea that before that project or so you were used to have around 1000 ton per year. This reached to the 3400 tons per year. The same thing in the common wheat. If you see the productivity in chickpea, this moved from 1.3 to 2 tons per hectare. In the case of common wheat, 1.3 tons to 1.6. In Uganda, you can see the similar kind of increment in common wheat and groundnut. Here you see the economic value also that how much annual value of grains we were able to enhance up to five folds or so. Same thing in Nigeria, if you see in the case of soya bean, here you see in the case of cowpea or Mali or even the India that you can see in the case of groundnut that earlier we were producing around 935 tons per hectare per year. Now this reached to the 3.8 tons per uh, year and same thing here in the case of pigeon pea that earlier we used to have just three tons per year we reached to the 1000 tons per year so i think this is really big success story and but as i said so this success story is not coming from one person two person but from large number of partners from 15 different countries and we are very much pleased to say that recently in september 2021 icris had won this prize africa food prize for 2021 for all the impact of this tropical legume projects in the different countries in Africa and I feel very privileged to be the PI of this particular project for about seven, eight years. So this is the way that how you can translate, how you can deliver these genetic gains to the farmer's field, etc. So with these words, I would like to summarize my presentation and would like to say that I think genomics and breeding innovations, they are very much required. They can expeditiously create and incorporate superior haplotypes in the breeding programs to drive future crop improvement. But we should not just focus on the genomics and breeding. We should also focus if we would like to deliver to the farmers on the robo seed system so that farmers can have access to the high improved varieties in short time in the real time. Farmers need to provide the access to the better markets, value addition, etc. As I said, so you need to have the rapid delivery system as well. The other thing when you are talking about the developing country, it's really very important that international agriculture agencies must train and develop next generation of crop scientists, empower farming communities by implementing farmer centric agriculture policies. Many international organizations should be doing and here I can see very successful example for instance from IPK. Even I was trained in IPK now I'm working in India and there are similar kind of many scientists. They are working in many developing countries who were trained in Europe or Australia or United States. So I think this is really very, very important. And modern technology combined with the farmers friendly agriculture policy is also very much required to transform agriculture and ensure food and nutrition security. Finally, I would like to say that international, national and local government agency support is very, very much required. In the end, I would like to say that to, to thank all of our partners and donors and supporters in the Center of Excellence in Genomics and Systems Biology, where I had a privilege to partner with more than 180 partners from more than 35 countries in six continents around the world during last 10, 15 years and in the different time phases for the different projects, not all partners on one project, but in the different projects, different time points. And thank you very much for your attention. I will be very happy to answer any question. Back to you, Dr. Salam. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, now we we started the uh, discussion. I just un allowed your mic, so please, if you have any questions, raise your hand and unmute your mic. I can see several questions in the chat box as well. So, Dr. Salam, yeah, okay. you, read yeah, you can, you can go question. ahead and read. It's okay, yeah. Okay, so Dr. Raji is a great scientist, love from Pakistan. Thank you very much, Hamza. I also appreciate for your kind words. Let me see the question. Thank you, genomic selection. When we discover the haplotype in some population is not applicable to other population due to different LD, how can solve this issue? Yes, this is also very important. So this is the question depending on those linkage block, etc. Sometimes what happens? that you are not able to bring those interesting superior haplotype in the elite population because earlier you were doing the traditional breeding and the crosses. But now if you know that this line is having really interesting superior haplotypes, 
you can make the crosses and you can create the larger population you can screen those population and can define can screen which recommend which lines are having those recombinants haplotypes and you can introgress so i think this is the way that to keep on moving further in this direction so i hope that you are able to understand this answer okay, okay. so far dr salam i am having only two questions one is comment i am really grateful to dr hamza ramjan okay mohammad ramjan what can be concluded from the network or haplotypes for the population genetic analysis well our analysis has indicated and i did not go in this detail especially in the case of chickpea when we did this analysis for about 3000 chickpea lines we find several interesting yeah. haplotypes and we also compared these haplotypes in the elite varieties we have analyzed about 120 elite varieties released in 10 different countries and then we asked the question how many of these elite varieties which have been released in 10 different countries for instance for the 100 seed weight which is an important component for the yield is having the hep superior haplotypes for those traits we were surprised that yes in some breeding lines they were able to have some haplotypes but not all so i think that this kind of analysis indicate that there is a still lot of scope where we can transfer many superior haplotypes from the land races to the elite breeding line so i think that we need to continue to do the population genetic analysis and then keep keep on improving these populations for the future future crosses also okay any any other questions please you is hand please those people who are interested to ask the question only they should unmute their mic if you are not asking question please mute your mic yes okay i have uh, one question yes please um you did a very great job about um, uh, sequencing of many legumes crop what is the future of fava bean sequencing <laughs> <laughs> i know it's hard <laughs> Yeah, so I think this good question, and many people ask this question. Then they ask me why I was not involved in fava bean. The thing is that we are having our sister CGR center. You all know Ikarda. They also have their office in Cairo. I know several friends in, and I have visited Cairo. Cairo is a beautiful city. But anyway, and several people, not only from Ikarda, but I think from UK and Canada, I heard that they already have assembled the fava bean genome. but they have not published if you are interested to know more then either you can connect contact donald o sullivan from the university of reading or christine bat from canada or some people like uh, aladin hamivi he is from cairo from ikada so wow. you can contact any of them so i think that these people have assembled but yeah, yeah. so when someone else is doing we should not be doing otherwise this will be redundant efforts isn't it yeah okay <laughs> uh, i know that on the solvent uh, did like um, seven cas uh, uh, marker for about 700 uh, snp marker and now he is i know that he um, is doing uh, ben genome analysis for fava bean something like yes. that okay. yes yeah, yes okay. so um Any further questions? Uh, chat room. I think we have a question. In... Okay. Ah, okay. We we have question in the chat room. Um, oh, what about the future? Of... Yeah. Uh, what about the future of the phenomics research in legumes? So as I said, so okay. So this phenomics. is very exciting area many well in my opinion phenotyping for the traits of interest for the breeders is very very key when you say the phenomics then people would like to go a range of the phenotyping technology starting from the greenhouse lamina tag lagi scan lot of interesting very fancy thing which is required which is very important but what happens when you do the phenotyping in the controlled environment and where you are controlling everything 
which is required when you are doing the functional genomics analysis, etc. But if you are more interested in the breeding, I am a big fan of the phenotyping of the plants when they are in the field conditions. When they are in the field, then they are basically having the natural thing that what kind of temperature, weather, all etc. Because when you will develop the varieties, the varieties you will not be growing those varieties in the room, you will be growing those varieties in the fields. So I'm a big fan of phenotyping in the field conditions. For that, nowadays the new technologies are coming, even the drone based system, or sometimes you are taking those pheno cards and you are taking those things on the cycle and all these different things in the field. So in my opinion, phenotyping is very, very important. When I say phenotyping, I would like to challenge our crop physiology and phenomics folks. They need to come up with the new technology in such a manner so that you can have precise high throughput phenotyping in minimal cost. So and this phenotyping should be in such a manner that now this is a predictive of the phenotyping in the field conditions. So I think this is a very important area and we all need to work in this different direction. That will I would like to suggest. OK, thank you for answering the question. Uh, do we have any further question? I think I see one question a... from Mohammed Ramjan, but I cannot read because I don't know whether you can read. <laughs> uh, uh, Are you able to read it? Because this is not very visible for me. Uh, also the same. You also have the same problem. Yes. I do not. Okay. Sorry about that, but anyway, yeah. Good. <sighs> OK, so. <clears throat> final try anyone anyone is interested to ask. OK, so by by the way, we don't have. OK. I don't know. OK, so thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. For for up. Thanks all participants for their attention and for asking their question. Yeah. Dr. Salam, I will be there for some more minutes because in India this is quite late, so I may not be able to join other presentation, but I'm really very excited to join this meeting. Okay. And thank you very much for your invitation. OK, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. And I will listen to Andreas Warner for some time, then I will go. Thank you. OK, good. <laughs> uh, could you please stop your sharing? Oh, this my sharing is not stopped. I thought I already shared. It stopped. Uh, stopped? OK. Uh, Dr. Andreas Pornar, could you please share your slides? Yes, I will. To 